by reading a Ghost uh, by Santina M. Uh, from Secrets Under the Earth's Crust. <clears throat> Once upon a time, a ghost wolf was roaming in the woods of Creepy Hollow. He was looking for the treasure of the town. There was a guard, but the wolf tried to slink in anyway. But the guard followed him. The wolf saw him. He ran as fast as he could deeper and deeper into the woods. He fell on a big thorn bush and howled in pain. It echoed. He knew. He just knew that he had a terrible cut. The guard ran to tell the castle on the other side of the land. He passed creepy hollows, wobbly bridge, and got to the castle, haunted house. He was punched by the king for not killing the wolf. Meanwhile, the wolf got up. He thought, I'm not going without a fight. He ran away from the bush and was gone. The wolf ran through the hills, the forest, and the lands to the castle. He was running so fast it almost seemed like he was flying. Guards flooded the castle, but the wolf got the treasure. The emerald eye. The king tried to grab the wolf. He escaped. He went to the village of ghost wolves. They were overjoyed, while the king and his castle swore that he would get revenge on the ghost wolves. To be continued. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Santina. Yes, this is a excerpt from my novel. Uh, it's a boy's relationship with a dog. He was suddenly struck by the idea to see Rico next door. He'd been neglecting Rico lately. Rico was a teenager too, except Rico was dying, and that was why Chris had been ignoring him. It was better not to see him that way, half blind and emaciated, maybe even deaf too. Mortality and decay made Chris want to do wild things. He gazed toward his garage windows. The night rain had arrived, accompanied by a misty fog that clouded over the glass. He rose from the chair, kicked the refrigerator door even though he knew it wouldn't shut, and pulled the string to open the garage. Out he stepped into the tender haze, the summer, the summer warm raindrops tapping against his face. He tapped the panel to close the garage and hoped the noise would not wake his mother. Last he'd seen, she was passed out on the couch wearing a party hat. It had been festive. His birthday and the scholarship, her new boyfriend and all the new family pictures. She was happiest most of all about Chris going for broadcast. She did not want him in print. She wanted different things for her firstborn. She had a, Chris had a mother who reported on crime and a father who taught high school kids about art. He heard all the right things about staying out of trouble, from her especially. She'd known Diego almost as long as her own son. She trusted they looked out for each other. Chris walked up his driveway and watched how the raindrops swept underneath the street light. He heard that voice inside him again, telling him that he noticed these things. Maybe he could wander deep into this rain. Instead, he spat on the cement and walked over to his neighbor's house. Jim and Nancy never locked the gate. They never locked their front door either. They attracted visitors at odd hours. Sometimes Chris would wave at Nancy while she got in her car to go to work and he'd be arriving home from a night out. Jim and Nancy had inherited the neighborhood bowling alley. Chris was 10 years old when he first smelled marijuana emanating from their house. Back then, he pictured a green stew stirred in a boiling pot. By the time he was a teenager, it had become pretty obvious what his father was up to when visiting Jim for hours on end. It was pretty comical when he claimed to have gone over to watch the Yankees. His mother would say Jim had never watched a baseball game in his goddamn life. His father would smirk and amble down the basement steps to turn out the lights and be alone. Chris opened the chain link gate into their backyard. The sky was turning from gray black to dark blue. Morning was close. The sun would evaporate any trace of the storm above and below. He minded all the shit on the cement while walking through the narrow alley between their backyards. The high white fence had been his mother's idea four years back. Maybe she thought it would cut into the weed stench, encourage his father Henry to stay home. Chris was not sure. His mother didn't like Jim and Nancy very much. She was always hoping they'd move away. The fence was the next best thing. Chris didn't have much of a relationship with his neighbors, but he had been close with Rico. Rico was a genuine member of their gang when they were young, skipping on his paws while they played wiffle ball on the street, trying to catch the plastic line drives in his teeth. If Rico caught a ball, it was usually deemed an automatic foul, unless he had left high. Then there would be arguments over whether the hit should be ruled a double. These arguments led to the adoption of Rico interference, a set of statutes design designed to broker peace. Usually the arguments were between Chris and Diego. It was never even broached that the dog be put behind his fence. Everyone loved him. The way his tongue would be hanging, the way he practically dropped his whole huge pit bull head into his water bowl when he needed to drink, 
The way he'd seemed to randomly run out of energy at one moment hopping and skipping like usual at the next stepped onto his side, stomach pulsating. Childhood times, age seven when Rico arrived on the scene to age 13 when the Twin Towers imploded and everyone seemed lost in the dust. Soon as Chris and Diego started at Holy Cross High School, their game shifted over to the park and usually revolved around basketball because it was the easiest way to get everyone involved, even the strange adults who hung around Triple Deuce on summer days like they had nowhere else to go. Rico would stare forlornly from behind the gate while they dribbled past him. Chris had to settle for taking Rico on walks. This was actually quite a service because Jim and Nancy were usually too stoned to take care of their dog, content to let him shit and piss in the backyard. Chris would often notice things on those walks with Rico, notice things that the voice in his head told him to notice that he'd write down in his journal, like how Rico would sniff curiously at the autumn leaves that had turned to wet mush splattered underneath the street curb. He'd sniff, make his curious dog face, and Chris would be reminded about his grandfather in the hospital bed when it was the end and Grandpa couldn't talk. Rico sniffing at those liquefied leaves in that loud way that dogs can sniff like it's the sound of them thinking. Rico would always be deliriously happy to see Chris approaching with the red leash, which was left hanging on the front porch hook. His tail would wag and he'd leap up to the fence to lick Chris's face before the gate was even open. Walking Rico around the neighborhood allowed him to project life forward. He figured being an adult couldn't be that hard, as hard as his parents made it seem. What did you do? You lived the life, took the dog for a walk, complained about taxes or your boss or whatever. What the fuck was so difficult? Why did it seem like they're always drowning in their own lives? The noise would be unbearable. When his brother started screaming at the tutors, it got to be really ridiculous. This was before he was diagnosed as a dyslexic, and Chris was wondering if he was just stupid. It was a loud house. It made his head hurt. It made his chest feel empty. Not empty like looking down a sewer gutter and there's nothing there. Empty like something had been there that had been taken away, stolen by the noise. Rico didn't yell. All he wanted to do was run on the grass of Memorial Field after the tennis balls that had rolled under the court fence, which Chris would scoop three at a time. At one point, he'd even seen Nancy was willing to let Chris have the dog, despite Rhonda's reservations. But that was all scuttled during an afternoon conversation with Jim, who explained to 13-year-old Chris that it was his dog, man, and he couldn't give up his dog completely. Chris got more upset than he anticipated. He accused Jim of not even giving a shit about Rico. That's when his father came over from washing the Cadillac. He didn't even bother putting down the sponge while shooing his son away. All Chris wanted in that moment was for his father to fight for him. Instead, his father and Jim had a conversation punctuated by laughter while Chris observed from the living room window. They shook hands and Jim went inside to yell at Nancy. From that moment, Chris grew more distant toward Rico. He could have him, but not completely. Rico was not his dog. It was around that time he smoked his first blunt and had his first 40 ounce. He started walking right by Rico while Rico stuffed his nose between the chains, climbed to the top of the fence. Always still excited to see Chris, though he was being completely ignored. Their meetings became limited to the early mornings when Chris returned home tanked. He'd wander into his neighbor's backyard and pet Rico, who was always left out, of the left out in his doghouse through rain or snow or suffocating heat. What if Rico could talk? What would he say? He used to take me on walks. He used to say you loved me. Now this is the best you got, asshole. Dropping in for some petting when you're sad and fucked up. They didn't even keep the leash out on the porch anymore. And Chris could tell Rico wasn't the same. His movements were stiff. His tail wagged without verve, as if it were an obligation. His eyes were unfocused, his hair patchier. He didn't want to chase his ring toy or even jump on the gate. There they would be upon many a dawn. Chris, drunk and high, sitting beside Rico, dying and blind. Chris had gotten the official news recently. Jim had the hose nozzle pointed at the sidewalk. It's Rico, man. Rico has cancer. Rico was in his usual position on this particular morning. His lower body inside his dilapidated doghouse with mold poking from the wood. His upper body spread on the lawn. His paws pushed outward like he had no goddamn intention of moving for anyone. And Chris was in his usual position on these drunken mornings, back against the doghouse, right hand over Rico's head, left hand picking at wet blades of grass. Long night, Chris said. He coughed into his hand because there was acid in his throat. You know, my grandpa and grandma had cancer too, Chris said to him. On the news the other day, they called this planet cancer. It was a special. Did you happen to see that? He asked Rico and laughed. Oh, you're a good boy, Rico. You're a good boy. Remember how you used to play? You used to be skipping on your paws. You'd just be waiting for someone to hit the ball. You couldn't wait, skipping, skipping, waiting, waiting. Man, you love to play. I used to love to play too. You remember those walks we took down the boulevard? into Flushing Memorial. We've gone so long, my mom thought I was kidnapped. You remember that? You remember that, Rico? 
He thought he could hear the dog's tail slapping against the corners of the doghouse wagging. He rubbed Rico's stomach. He used to be such a majestic animal. Shoulders like boulders, a jacked pit, not a dog any dog wanted to fuck with. Before Chris lifted weights, he was like a twig. He, made, he was sure it made for a funny visual, this tall toothpick kid walking this massive pit bull down the block. People used to shout from their cars, Yo, cool dog! Rico loved leaping toward the crotches of strangers. He loved to lick the faces of children. He loved to feel involved and appreciated. All Chris wanted to do was walk Rico again, be that person again, have another chance. How was it that he could do the things that he'd done and still feel like the same child he was when he had his hand pressed against Rico's rough fur? God, do you remember, he asked Rico and wiped his eyes. Do you remember? Rico lifted his head and put his head in Chris's lap. He sprawled onto his side, kicking against the doghouse. Sprawled onto his side just like he used to do when he'd be exhausted from skipping on his paws for two or three hours straight. We're going to be all right, Chris said to Rico. Rico yawned. His eyes were peering straight ahead into the nothingness that was all he could see. I'm going to take you to college with me. You're going to be my roommate. The dog began licking his hand. Then he closed his eyes and fell asleep. Chris could feel Rico's loud heartbeat against his hand, a heartbeat like a parade drumbeat. He looked toward the sky. The stars had surrendered to the morning. There had to be others like him out there. Even if they were totally fucking up and doing horrible shit, couldn't there be a second life? Rico, Chris said, and he felt the dog's ear perk against his lap. Dark orange was beginning to spread on the horizon, painted in a being by some invisible hand. I'm going to do better. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so much for you.